module 2 will be tackling your module 2, microscopy, and morphological classification of your bacteria. So since you entered college, even in your, uh, if, you, if you were a part of your senior high, you've been dealing with microscopes. So let's tackle them a bit. Let's refresh. Okay. So the etiology of microscopy, when you say etiology class, is the, so the source, the source of the word. Now, microscopy is derived from the Latin word micro, which means small, and the Greek word scopos, meaning to look at. Now, remember, your microbiome, one, specifically your bacteriology, will be handling with microorganisms. So you'll be handling very small organisms. Thus, you have to be equipped with the necessary equipment to view them or analyze them specifically your microscopes. Now, with the use of microscopes, you'd be able to see these microbes that are measured in smaller units. These smaller units specifically are called your, are used are your micrometer and your nanometer. So most bacteria class have a size of 0.4 to 2.0 micrometer. So it's very small class, sobrang liit niya. Um, then, there are many types of microscope class, then there are some classifications. One of those classifications would be according to the number of lenses. So first we have your simple microscope. Now your simple microscope class consists of a single biconcave magnifying lens. Now this would be your magnifying lens class in this case, specifically this part, the objective. Now it, this type of lens or objective only has a 10 times magnification. Now, when I was in my college years, specifically uh, second year, we had a class known as your botany. So this would involve the study of plants. Now, one of our teachers would require us to bring a cut of newspaper. Then we'd visualize it using a simple microscope. Then we'd view, uh, in, in, in a magnified manner, the letters. Now, the problem with a simple microscope class is this is not recommended for your bacteria. Because remember, your bacteria are very small you would need at least an oil immersion objective. Now, who can tell me, based on your memory, if you still remember, what is the magnification of your OIO class? 100 times. 100 times. So it's your 100 times. Right? So you need at least 100 times magnification to view your bacteria. Thus, we consider your simple microscope obsolete. Um, Normally, in nowadays class, I don't think they still have this type of microscope. Uh, they no longer use this. What they would be using nowadays in schools and universities is your compound microscope. Now, your compound microscope has two or more lenses and is classified based on illumination. So when you say illumination class, this would refer to your light source. So we'll tackle that in the next few slides. So this is an example class of your compound microscope. So we have different um, lenses, specifically objectives. Now, uh, can anyone tell me the magnification of your eyepiece? Do you still remember? Ten times. Ten times. Ten times, sir. All right. So ten times. Very good. So can you tell me the magnification of your LPO? What's the magnification of your low power objective class? Ten times. Ten times. Ten times. Ten times. Ten times. Okay. How about for your HPO? Okay, I forgot something. How about, how about your scanner class? Four times. Four, four times. Four. Excuse me. How about your OIO? Your oil immersion objective? Okay, that's happening. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Now, uh, do you know the term, the word total magnification? Can anyone tell me how would you get your total magnification class? Eyepiece times. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, I'm objective lenses, yeah. All right, very good. So it's your eyepiece times your objective. Galing, ah. you, still, you, still, you guys still memorize, you remember your... Ano. So your total magnification class, when you view something under your scanner, would be 40 times. While for your LPO, it would be 100 times. For your HPO, it would be 400 times. Then for your OIO, it would be 1,000 times. So in the future, if you encounter uh, what at what magnification do you usually view your bacteria, it would be 1,000 times magnification. Now, uh, let's, let's test your knowledge again. Now, um, if you want to focus um, in LPO, 
among the two nabs between course and fine adjustment, adjustment, which which one would you choose? Course, course. course adjustment. All right, so this would be your, for your LPO. Now, how about your fine adjustment class? Or HPO and OIO. All right, very good. So it's your HPO and OIO. Now, class, I want to make uh, I, I want to uh, explain something to you. In the future, once you're your interns, um, you'd be asked by some of your uh, uh, seniors, specifically your section head or the staff working in the, the in a certain section, to focus uh, the, the the microscope using your OIO. Now, don't go straight. Wag kayong dederecho kaga na to point OIO kaga tapos yah adjust na. You start step by step. You first focus it on LPO. You adjust only the course adjustment knob. Then, after you focus in the LPO, you move it to the HPO. Then you adjust it again using the fine adjustment knob. Then, lastly, you would go for your oil immersion objective. Never ever go straight directly to the oil. Um, this allows you, as a class, if you do the step by step. This would allow you a better visualization of the entire slide. So let's say you're being asked to find, ano, to find a clump, a clump. When I say clump, a group, a group or a cluster of bacteria. Sa LPO palang, even in LPO, you can actually have an idea on their location. So you can adjust. You can actually scan the entire slide, viewing it, viewing it totally. So that when you focus it in the HPO, then to the OIO, you could get a, a more accurate positioning on what. Uh, what to read or what to see. Okay. Now, um, according to light to illumination class, this is another classification of microscope would be your light microscope and your electron microscope. Now, since this is based on illumination, we're talking about your light source. So your light microscope would employ visible light source as a source of illumination. Now, let's go back. Now, this would be class, your light source. This is your illumination. Now, I just want to share something to you very archaic. Nung, nung college ako class, we had a microscope wherein we had to use uh, a, a, another, an external source of light. So when I say external source of light class, we use a flashlight. Meron pa ng time noon na we had to focus uh, using the sunlight. So imagine nyo, nasa classroom kami din, pag, pag wala kang ano, pag, pag makulimlim or it's kind of ano, cloudy, nahihirapan kami mag-focus. So in the long run naman, by the time na nakarating na ako ng third year and fourth year, we started using this type of microscope, which has its own light source. So I guess um, your generation is pretty lucky that hindi nyo yung ma-encounter yung ganong hassle. So back on topic, your light microscope would employ visible light as a source of illumination. Then another type of uh, microscope according to, to your illumination would be your electron microscope. Now your electron microscope would employ beams of electrons as a source of illuminations. So this is, a, is another type of uh, light source class. I'll show this to you later. Okay, let's tackle the different types of light microscope class. The first one would be your bright field microscope. Now, this is the most common type of microscope you'd encounter. In this type of microscope class, you would be viewing your object or organism against a dark, against a bright background. Uh, this doesn't technically mean a bright, the dark sa class. It could be colored. The organism is specifically colored against a bright background. Now. In this case, visible light is passed through a specimen and through a series of lenses that bends the light, resulting, the mag resulting in the magnification of the organism. So I'll explain this later in the next slide. Now, your bright field microscope is commonly used for visualization of your bacteria, fungi, and parasites. Now, if you notice on this statement, you do not see the word virus. So you can't use your bright field microscope for your viruses. So I'll, I'll discuss that later on what type of microscope you would use whenever you want to view a virus. Now, uh, I'm happy that most of you, I think all of you still remember the rules on your magnification. So good job on that. Now, I just want you to take note of this class. Now, um, most compound or bright field microscope have three or four objectives. Yung iba walang scanner, yung iba meron. So just a, just a marking for you to know which type of objective is that. Your LPO, your low power objective, has a yellow Band. Meron siyang yellow band class to objective. It would appear, ayun na, this is the band. This is the band, the yellow band. And uh, that would signify that that is an LPO. And another one would be your HPO. Uh, the band is color blue. And then your OIO would be gray. 
gray or black. So remember those markings. So you won't, you'll have an easier time to identify your objective. Now, your total magnification class would uh, involve, as you said, eye lens magnification times objective lens magnification. So good job on that for still remembering. Now, uh, as the statement earlier said, class, um, for your bright field, light, your light produced from the light source would pass through a certain lenses, specifically your condenser lenses. Now, when your light passes through the condenser lenses, it would split up, magbibend siya, class, focusing toward the specimen, making it more visible through the naked eye. Then here's an example, guys, of how your bacteria will appear against a bright background in a bright field microscope. So if you can see, if you can notice that the organism would appear colored, colored or dark against a bright background. So this is an example, guys, of your bacillus. A gram-negative bacillus. Then again, uh, an example of your bright field microscope. Now, after your bright field micro microscope class comes your dark field microscope. In this type of microscope class, your object would appear bright against a dark background. This is because there is a dark field condenser. So, kabalik para naman class, this is the opposite. Instead of having your uh, a bright background against a colored or dark specimen, this time your specimen would appear bright or glowing. Uh, not technically glowing, but just bright. Uh, against a dark background. Now, this is usually used to routinely observe for your treponema pallidum. Class, do you have any idea what disease your treponema pallidum causes? May idea kayo? Anong sakit ang tinukos niya? I'll give you a clue. It starts with the letter S. Syphilis. Okay, so it's known to cause your syphilis. Now, your syphilis class, this is a type of STD, sexually transmitted disease. Now, depending on the progress of the disease of your syphilis, there are many types, may latent syphilis, may primary, etc., and so on. So I won't discuss that. I'll let the lecture handle that. What your syphilis class is known for on um, whenever you will encounter it in the, is this in the future, wherein you'll be forced to swab. Kadiri, but anyways. Um, what is known for syphilis class is that it is known to produce what you call a chancre. C-H-N-C-R-E. Chancre. Now, this chancre class, this is a non, uh, a painless, painless lesion, painless lesion with even edges. So, I tried, I wanted to post a picture of this, but masyado kasing katiri. Baka yung iba sa inyo ayaw. So, again, your syphilis is a sexually transmitted disease class, and it is known to cause your chancre, a painless lesion with even edges. And another one that you could use for dark field microscopy would be your cryptococcus neoformans. Now, this is a type of fungi a type of fungi that is considered opportunistic. Opportunistic. Now, when you say opportunistic class, they would hit or cause disease. Cause disease when a patient is immunocompromised. Immunocompromised. So this is not commonly uh, known to cause um, disease, uh, specifically pulmonary disease among HIV patients. And here's an example class of your cryptococcus neoformans. So, cryptococcus neoformans class are known to have a capsule. Here's the capsule class. This is entire white part is the capsule. Now, the yeast, specifically your cryptococcus, is this one. Now, who can tell me how do yeast reproduce class? Paano nagre-reproduce ang mga fungi niya? Mm, Through spore? Okay, I'm looking for the word that starts with the letter B. Budding. All right. So, so it's your budding. Your binary fission class, that is how your fungi, uh, your bacteria reproduces. So your budding class. Now, this is an example of your budding. When you say budding class, it would refer to your branching. Nagsasanga-sanga. Uh, fungi, specifically yeast, are known to bud. So they would produce another a counterpart of themselves. 
ano, parang parang may branch off siya. That's how they would reproduce. And your binary fission is how bacteria would reproduce. Now, if you know the word fusion, the opposite of fusion is, uh, the meaning of fusion is to combine, while the opposite of fusion is fission, meaning to separate. So, a single bacteria would divide, and would be two, and would divide again, and so on, and so forth. Kaya sobrang bilis nilang dumami class. Then, here's an example class of your Treponema pallidum, or your spirochips. Now, they would appear, spirochips class would appear as twisty. Twisty, twisted, twisty. And they would uh, appear bright against a dark field microscope. So here for this part class, you have your dark condenser ring. Light would pass and it would be bended, but certain light would not directly hit the entire space or rather the entire background, making it dark. It would only reflect on the specimen. So if you notice, so only one ray would, would hit the specimen, making it dark making it bright. Then another one of your light microscope would be your face contrast microscope. Your face contrast microscope class is used to observe unstained specimen. So let's say class of you want your bacteria to be viable. So when I say viable, alive, you want them to be viewed alive. You would use uh, your face contrast microscope. Because when you stain, when you stain your bacteria, they would die. So let's say you want them alive, you want them viable, you would use your face contrast microscope. Now, your face contrast microscope class would refract la, uh, the light from the, from the surrounding towards the organism. So instead na um, there would be light, equal light sa background nyo, this one, gagamitin niya yung background niya, yung background ng slide as a, as a source of light. It enhances, it enhances the appearance of colorless or transparent organism used in wet mounts and allows observation of viable specimen. Primarily used in visualization of important fungi. So let's take a look. So here's an example class of what your face contrast microscope would look like. Now if you notice, the background would be dark or more than colorless or decrease yung contrast niya, yung, yung, yung light. And if you notice, the specimen would appear glowing. Uh, that, would, that would reflect wherein the light on the background would be absorbed or rather would be reflected towards the specimen or the bacteria, making it more visual, making it more visual. Then another one would be your fluorescence microscope. Now your fluorescence microscope class, instead of a normal light source, it would be using your ultraviolet light. Now we're in your ultraviolet light class would strike dyes in pigments. This dyes and pigments class would emit longer wavelength. Now, this dyes and pigments class are known as your fluorophores or fluorochromes, which absorbs UV light. It causes your organism to glow against a dark background. Typically class, your fluorescence microscope is used in immunodiagnostics. It demonstrates antibodies stained with fluorescent dye combining with specific antigens. So, so hypothetical class, let's say, uh, you have your COVID-19 antibody, COVID-19 antibody. What the med tech would do, they would stain it using a fluorescence microscope. And after staining, they would inject it uh, towards the body. And remember, your antibodies would attack uh, a specific antigen. So, hahanapin niya yung COVID-19 virus. Your, COVID your stained COVID-19 antibody would then attach, would then attach toward the COVID-19 virus. And dun, dun makikita ng medtech, uh, ayun, nag-attach yung, nag yung nagpo-flores na antibody dun sa COVID-19 virus. So it's more like an identification method. Then a problem class usually seen among your fluorescence microscope, specifically the stains, is your quenching or photobleaching. Your quenching class would refer to the fading of fluorescence. Nawawala yung fluorescence class due to exposure to light energy. This can be prevented by storing the fluorescent slides in a dark container and refrigeration at 2 to 8 degrees centigrade. Now, I just want to share to your class a practice ko, since I'm handling uh, a lot of uh, uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis, MTB. You actually use your uh, fluorescence microscopy on this one. So we encounter quenching plenty of times. So what we do, whenever we read, 
whenever we would read uh, the slides, we turn off the light. We will turn off the light on the entire room to prevent your quenching. So um, easier, it, it makes it easier since uh, may sarili namang light source yung microscope. Now, just to explain to your class how it works, uh, your UV light will come from the site. And notice nyo sa mga previous, um, previous examples or all your light source were found at the bottom. Now for your uh, fluorescence microscopy, the, the light source will be found at the site. Now remember you're dealing with UV light here. Your UV light is considered carcinogenic or dangerous to the eye or harmful. So what will happen would be your light source would find will enter a exciter filter. Now, the exciter filter in your class would somehow weaken, weaken or filter the UV light, making it uh, weakened. Then it would pass through a lightweight splitting mirror. Then it would proceed to the specimen. Then uh, you would view it under the eyepiece. If you notice, there's actually a barrier filter between the eyepiece and the eye. That would protect your eye from the UV light. Okay, let's proceed to your electron microscope. Now, there are two types of electron microscope class. One of the latest would be your scan probe electron microscope. Now, your scan probe EM will produce a three-dimensional image. Because when you say three-dimensional, this is very detailed. Um, if you notice that there's some cartoons, they would only make uh, mga stick people, siguro. Yung mga dating-dating luma lang, mga stick people na cartoons. Now, um, with 3D, they would have uh, a proper a proper body. Oh, sorry sa drawing ko. And that's never good at art. So that's how you do 3D. More, more visible, more detailed. Now, the problem class with EM kasi is that it is a major capital investment. Sobrang mahal niya. It costs millions. And aside from that class, it is not needed for common, and I repeat common, laboratory diagnosis. This is more used on research. Research. And one of those research involving your EM would be your viruses. So if you're going to be asked what type of microscope is best in visualizing viruses, it would be your EM, electron microscope. And another one, an uh, older version, would be your transmission EM. It produces a 2D, two-dimensional image of the cell structure. So here's an example class of your EM. So this is very big class. Actually, this is um, almost half, uh, siguro mga four feet ang laki. Then sobrang bigat din. I've only seen one sa picture. I've never seen uh, a live or a real one in person. So remember, you would be using electron beams here. Now, your electron beams are produced by your electron gun. Your electron gun will produce the beams that they will pass through magnetic lenses. Your magnetic lenses class acts as your adjustment knobs. So, dyan kayo magpo-focus if you want to see it more visible, if you want to adjust the, you know, the uh, magnification and so on. Then, it would pass through and you could actually view the specimen. So, let me show you class a picture of what a bacteria would look like under an EM. Now, this is an example class of your bacillus. Notice that they are rod shaped. Notice that they are very 3D. They are very detailed. The shape, the shape is very visible. But then again, kasi class, in routine laboratory nyo, pag nagmerte kayo, you don't actually need to, to see this. You could actually use even a compound microscope lang, and then you just have to stain them. Then you'll have the, the main uh, idea na, ah, this is a bacillus. I'll, I'll explain that further more in the next, uh, in the, almost at the end of the presentation. And this class would be your coronavirus. Now, notice the crowns, the crowns and or the thorns surrounding the outer layer of the virus. Now, this is only visible via the use of your EM. So, it's a very big help talaga class whenever you're gonna handle research on viruses. EM is the best option yung me na meron kayo. And if I recall, your EM could go as high as 2,000 times magnification. Now, let's proceed to your handling and care of your microscope. Now, you have to carry the microscope in an upright position with two hands. One hand supporting the base and the other hand supporting the arm. Class, what is the importance of your arm? Of the arm of the microscope? Why do you need to handle that? Bakit hindi nyo nalang hawakan ang dalawang kamay yung base? Why do you need to include the arm? Any ideas? Para hindi mahulog, sir. May support. Oh, ma. Eh, pag kinawakan ko rin yung bottom, may support pa din. So, bakit kailangan pa sa may arm? Ang balance, sir. Okay, balance. Okay, okay. Ano pa? 
to protect the objectives. Okay, to protect the objectives. Something so, to hold on. Ah, uh, may something to hold on. Okay, okay, so this would be your arm class. Now, if you notice, yung arm, uh, may pasokan ng kamay. Then, I just want you to remember class, whenever you deal, handle the base part, this would deal with the lower portion of your microscope as a support. Now, your arm, you have to remember class that this part, your eyepiece, are detachable. Your objectives are detachable. So imagine if you suddenly, um, if you did not, uh, let's say, properly attach them, then you were just holding the base. There's a possibility that all of a sudden it could, it could, um, it could detach, mahulo. So if you if you are supporting it with the arm, you could easily adjust or manipulate the the position of the entire microscope, and your arm would support the upper portion, the upper portion of the entire microscope. So tama naman yung mga sagot niya plus. And then, after that, so you have to move it or carry it in an upright position with two hands, one hand in the base and the other hand clasping the arm. Now, you have to place the microscope carefully on the working table about one, one inch away from the table edge. So, um, not technically one inch class. If malaki kayong tao, let's say you're very tall, you could go as high as two inch, depending sa ano nyo. And you have to measure then na dapat comfortable kayo all the time whenever you use a microscope. Then you have to remove the dust from the microscope using a soft brush. Preferably camel hair or you may blow it away. Only after this should the lenses be cleaned with lens paper. That's actually, alam mo, sa, sa totoong practice, this is rarely done sa laboratory. What they would use is your lens paper. And may mga ibang laboratory class, they do not use lens paper. They would use gauze. So, nakaka, nakakasira, nagkakaroon ng scratches. So, if possible class, in the future, once you're working, try to use lens paper. Because your lens paper wouldn't cause scratches sa microscope nyo. So, ewan ko naalala nyo, when you were using microscope nyo, um, there were times when you viewed the microscope, there would be scratches. So, akala nyo, pag in-adjust nyo lang yung, yung knobs, mawawala siya. Sadly, nasa eyepiece pala yung, yung scratches. Na. Then, you have to clean the eyepiece lens with dry lens paper. And yung objective lens naman, class, you have to clean it with lens paper moistened with silene or 95% ethanol. Now, if your microscope is equipped with an electric cord, check if it is in good condition before plugging into the outlet. Now, because I want you to take note that there are smart type of microscope that are 120 volts and 220 volts. Now, whenever you're going to plug it in the future, once you're interns and future med techs, you have to remember to make sure that the plug is is um, accurate or equal to the corresponding voltage. So, dapat yung 110 volts nyo, pag sinaksak nyo yun sa saksakan, you have to make sure that it is also 110 volts. Hindi yung pag yung 220 volts, sinaksak mo sa 110 volts class, you're gonna cause short circuit. Masisira yung fuse ng microscope and mapapabayad ka pa. Now, kung lukuloko yung, yung staff or yung ano nyo, baka yung bang microscope pa yung pagbayarin sa inyo. So, be careful of that. Always remember that to make sure, check nyo yung cord or yung yung label ng microscope, i-check nyo yung voltage. Then make sure that the scanner or your low power objective is in a focusing position. Then always start each new observation at scanner or LPO. So as I said nga, don't go directly sa OIO. Always start at the lowest possible. If you can start at scanner, much better. Sa scanner pa lang, try to find your target. If you could see now uh, a clump of colored uh, bacteria or something, or the target organism, then you could start from there. Then you keep shifting to a higher objective. Then manipulation of your microscope. So you have to place the prepared slide carefully on the stage and security stage clip or a bracket. Then observe under OIO. Draw and describe the morphological appearance of, your, of the bacteria using the different prepared slides. So um, I'm going to show you class. Uh, mag lang tayo. I'm just going to show you something. Wait lang. I'll, I'll discuss that later. So this is an a virtual uh program that will deal with your microscope. So let's try exploring it. Now you have an opportunity to view different slides in this room. You have, let's say, um, let's look at a bacterial slide. 
Let's look at a gram stain bacteria. So normally, let's view it in, in a scanner mode. So remember what you're first going to do whenever you're going to deal with your scanner or your low power objective will be your course focus. So you keep adjusting. You keep adjusting until you see something. Now, once you're able to see something, you shift to a higher objective. Then you could start adjusting the light. So masyadong dark. Masyadong maliwanag. You could actually use a fine focus. Okay. And then you shift to your HBO. So if you notice, class, for the HBO, nagpano yung light, nagdarken siya. So you make it bright. Then you could adjust. Dito pa lang, you can actually find na your target. And then let's say this one. This would be a nice. So what you're looking here, class, is a positive for rods. So they are positive for bacilli, specifically Bacillus subtilis and Neisseria subclava. So before going to your OIO class, you have to add your immersion oil. So let's click on the immersion oil. And then move. It's, you could actually move and see. So this would be your bacillus. So what happens, let's say, um, loko -loko ka, um, you want that you all of a sudden, masyado kang hindi mo na focus yan. And all of a sudden, you did this class. Oh. Bigla niyong, bigla niyong uh, sudden, sudden change ng course adjustment. So nakita niyo nabasag, nabasag yung slide. So be careful with that in the, in the future, okay? So, I'm going to explain to you class yung activity. Niya. So, let's look at another, another slide. Um, let's try plant slides. So, plant cells. So, your plant cells class are best visualized in LPO and HPO only. So, let's look at it in your course first. And this is what your plant cells would look like. They are very big uh, squared, squared cells. Now, let's move to your low power objective. Hindi tayo ng medyo maganda. Or we can actually see the nucleus. Uh, then we shift to HBO. So if you see, it's medyo blurry siya and medyo dark. So you adjust the light. Not too bright. It's enough. Uh, so you can actually see the cell. And let's say you want to remove the slide now. So, gusto mo maglipat ng slide. You have to remember class yung paglilinis. So, um, let's try another one. A human, let's look at a blood sample. So, let's look at it in a scanner objective. Then, low power objective. And it's just the light. Then you move to your HPO. So this is what your RBCs would look like under your microscope. And this big one is your WBC. So any questions, class, in regarding sa pagkalikot na microscope? So I'll share to you the link later. You may feel free on your spare time to practice this. It's actually a good uh, virtual program. Na nato kaya tawo na tawa ako when Miss Barredo, your another microbiology teacher, shared this. So let's go back on the topic. Okay. Now there are methods class in identifying your bacteria. Um, remember, class, your bacteria could come in a living state, a viable state, and a fixed state. Now, your living state, class, whenever you uh, want to identify your living state bacteria is you have to see first proof of life. So one of those proof of life na buhay siya would be your motility. Now, your motility can be classified into two types, false and true motility. Now, let's first focus on false motility. Your false motility, meaning hindi talaga siya totoong motile, is your Brownian movement. Now, your Brownian movement class 
is characterized by a random jiggling or shaking of the bacteria in the same position. So imagine nyo ito yung bacteria and it just moves. Nag-shake-shake-shake lang siya or nag-regal lang siya in the same position. Now, the reason for that class is because molecules, molecules would hit. Remember, you're viewing this at a very low, uh, high magnification. So your molecules are hitting the bacteria, causing them to shake. Now, uh, that is what you call your Brownian movement. Now, if you want to know what is true motility, true motility class is characterized by a directional porphosphol motility. So imagine if this is your bacteria, then every few seconds, you would see a progressive movement. Kumagalaw siya class from one position to another. And then another one to visualize your bacteria in a fixed state or dead will be your stain. Now, um, your, your living state class can be done via wet mount preparation and hanging trap preparation. So let's discuss them one by one. This is an example class of your wet mount preparation. So you get a slide. Then you place a drop of sterile water on the slide. After placing the drop of sterile water, you place the specimen by using a loop. You may use a loop, loop. you may use a needle, depending on the type of the specimen. After placing the specimen in the water, you're going to put a cover slip. <coughs> Excuse me. After placing the cover slip class, you're going to view it now under the microscope. And what you would see class is this. Now, if I recall, I took this in a, a botany book. This is a, an example of an algae class. So this is the type. This is the appearance of your algae in a wet mount. Then another one class would be your hanging drop, hanging drop motility test. Now your hanging drop motility test class would use what we what we call biconcave slide. The reason why it's called a biconcave slide class is because it has a depression. Now, in this case class, um, remember your wet mount is using a flat slide. So in this case, the same procedure, you're going to add sterile water, then you're going to add the specimen. Then you're going to place the cover slip. But this time, prior to adding the cover slip, you have to place a sealant, a sealant known as your petroleum jelly. So imagine if this is your slide class, then this is your, the, the, the depression. So you're going to add a cover slip. Prior to adding, you have to make sure that the sides have petroleum jelly. Now, the purpose class of why there is petroleum jelly is to prevent excess water, excess specimen, from seeping outside, leaking outside the cover slip. Kasi class, alam nyo sa wet mount, whenever, once you place um, the water, the specimen, tapos nilagay nyo yung cover slip, magpapapress down yan, kakalat yan, and it will tend to seep out sa sites. But with the help of your petroleum jelly class, that, that is being prevented. And aside from that, meron siyang depression. Your depression would allow the uh, the mix um, liquid in the specimen to not leak as well and to provide more surface area for your bacteria to be viewed. Okay? Naintindihan? Any questions? Okay, I'll proceed now. Now, let's proceed now class to your bacterial structure. Now, this is the component of your bacterial structure class. Now, normally, in some bacteria, they will have the first layer as capsule. Then comes your cell wall, your plasma membrane. Then we're now in your cytoplasm. Now, your cytoplasm would contain ribosomes, nucleoid, plasmid, and there's also your pili and your flagellum. Now, let's discuss them one by one. Now, first, of, first one class would be your capsule. Your capsule class is not common to all bacteria. This, this is a slimy, gelatinous area around the cell wall. And it is fa antiphagocytic. Class, who can tell me the meaning of phagocytosis? Cell-engulfing. Cell okay, cell-engulfing, cell-eating. All right, very good. Now, antiphagocytic class, your capsule would increase, would increase the resistance of your bacteria from being eaten. Last question, what type of cell would eat your bacteria? Macrophage. Aside from macrophage? Neutrophils. Okay, it's your neutrophils. Actually, class, 
uh, just to just to clarify yeah. um your neutrophils and monocytes are known to cause uh, phagocytosis now yung sinasabi niyong macrophage class this is what you call monocytes when they are found in tissues they also phagocytize so para alam nila yung difference ng monocyte sa macrophage Monocyte, this is found in your peripheral blood, in your circulation. Yun yung type of WBC. Now, when your monocytes are found in your tissues, they would become macrophages. Now, I have a question. Just a trivia. What do you call the macrophage, ay, the macrophage found in your lungs? Any ideas? Last cell? No, no. Alveolar. Alveolar. <laughs> so it's an alveolar macrophage. Okay. Um, what do you call the macrophage found in your connective tissue? Connective tissue naman class. Mast cells. What? Mast cells. Uh, mast cells. No, no, it's not mast cells. Connective tissue. Monocytes. Hindi. <laughs> Starts with the letter H. Histocytes. Histocytes. Oh, sorry, sorry. Histocytes. Okay. So from iba histology niya related sa connective tissue. So histocytes. Um, another one would be your... Um, how about the macrophage found in your meninges? Meninges. Starts with the letter M. Uh, my microglia. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Very good. So in that class, so just just for you to have an idea, your monocytes when they enter the tissues, they would tend to have a different name depending on the tissue. So iba iba. If it's found in the lungs, um, they would become alveolar. So anyways, na, na off topic tayo. So okay. So antiphagocytic sa class, it would increase the resistance of the bacteria from being eaten by neutrophils and monocytes. Now, an example class of bacteria with capsule would be your Streptococcus pneumoniae. Streptococcus pneumoniae. Now, your Streptococcus pneumoniae class this is in a gram-positive, gram-positive diplococci. So when you say diplococci class, pairs. So the long coxi. And another one would be your Neisseria meningitidis and your Haemophilus Neisseria. And your Haemophilus influenza, influenza, Haemophilus H A E M O P H I L U S. Now, these three types of organisms are examples of bacteria with capsule. Now, uh, in the laboratory, if you want to know if a bacteria has capsule, if you want to verify they have capsule, we have your so-called Neufeld Quellum test. Now, your Neufeld Quellum test class would act as a, uh, a capsular swelling test. This would uh, use, be used to identify bacteria with capsules. So let me show to you the positive result of that. So here's an example of a positive swell capsule of Streptococcus. If you notice class, the capsule, parang katulad ng Cryptococcus, no? They are swelled. They are swelled, they are very big, yan, makikita nyo. Then this is your Streptococcus demanding. So again, they are diplococci. So by pairs, sila na coxi. So this is a positive swelled capsule of your Streptococcus. Then another one is after your cell wall, after your capsule would be your cell wall. So your cell wall class is common to most bacteria. Almost all bacteria class has cell wall. Now your cell wall has a very big importance in identifying bacteria. Your cell wall will determine the gram positivity and negativity of your bacteria. So when I say gram positivity class, you would be using your gram stain. Now, just to have an idea, just for your class to have an idea. Uh, since this would be in a, in a different module, your gram-positive would appear, the bacteria would appear when stained, would appear purple, would appear purple or violet. While if it's negative, gram-negative, it would appear as, it would appear as pink, pink or red, but more on pink, pink side tayo. Now, um, the reason class it can determine gram positivity and neg negativity is because of the presence of 
peptidoglycan. Now, peptidoglycan cast is the main component of your cell wall. It would determine the gram positive and negativity. Now, if your if your peptidoglycan in the cell wall is very thick, it would be gram positive. Now, the reason for that is because thick peptidoglycan would absorb more would absorb more the primary stain, the primary stain, which is your crystal violet, while your thin peptidoglycan would uh would have less, less to none of absorbing your primary stain, making it gram negative. So, meron kasi siyang pinatawag less na secondary stain, your carbo, uh, your saffronin. So, that would make it gram negative. So, I'll discuss that in a future um, module. So, pag thick yung peptidoglycan, gram positive, appearing purple or violet. Pag thin peptidoglycan, gram negative, appearing as pink or reddish. Then, your cell wall class would define the shape of the bacteria and is the usual site of antibiotic action. Plus, I want to hear your ideas. Sa dami-dami ng parte ng bacteria, bakit si cell wall ang site of antibiotic action? Bakit ito? Bakit itong cell wall? What's, ano meron kay cell wall? Any ideas? Come on. Receptors, eh? Mm, receptors, okay. What else? Mm -hmm. yeah, we're talking about antibiotic action. Bakit hindi yung loob ng nucleus? Bakit hindi yung loob ng cytoplasm? Yes, the one I see, sir. Kay sir, ang cell wall ang nangisaran sa bacteria cell. Hindi ko wala ng wall. Mas mm -hmm. mapahitirate yun sa antibiotic. Alright, alright, very good. So, class, imagine if, uh, if the bacteria reaches, uh, if the antibiotic who target the bacteria, they first have to go the first layer. So, imagine yung walang capsule. Walang capsule yung bacteria. Now, um, they would first, the antibiotic would first have to destroy your cell wall. That's making it the first site. Because if they do not destroy the cell wall, they would not be able to penetrate the insides of your bacterium, making it useless. Making it useless. Parang naging walang kwenta yung antibiotic niya class kung hindi niya masisira yung cell wall. Now, meron kasing mga bacteria class later I will discuss that have very thick, uh, thick cell wall and meron pa sila mga other structures. Now, another, um, di ba sabi ko, uh, your cell wall is common to most but not all. Now, there are types of bacteria that have no cell wall. They are called your mycoplasma and your urea plasma. These are organisms without cell wall. Now, question. Have you heard of the word commensal? Yes, okay. sir. So, what yes, does the sir. word commensal mean? Non pathogenic. Non What else? Doktongan yung non pathogenic. Kasi class, may mga non pathogenic kapag napunta sa immunocompromise, naging pathogenic. So, anong kadoktong ng non pathogenic? Dili kaya niyan. Two organisms that benefit from each other. Okay, so um, technically not that we benefit uh, for this one. Because if, if it's living in the humans, humans can technically benefit from commensal. So just to give you uh, um, a better understanding, your commensal organisms class, these are non-pathogenic organisms that do not directly cause damage. Does not cause directly damage. So regardless of what happens class, na um, it will cause damage. Even if you're immunocompromised, even if you're damaged, or if you're sick, you wouldn't get uh, sickness. Now, your normal flora kasi class, these are also non-pathogenic. But remember, if the patient, in this case, if the person became, became immunocompromised, they suddenly become pathogenic. But in the case of your commensal, regardless if they become immunocompromised or not, they would never cause this disease or disorder. So they are commensal organisms, plus your mycoplasma and urea plasma, and they um, somewhat would call uh, harmonious, harmonious sa ecosystem ng body. Okay, another one would be your plasma membrane. So we discussed that the three parts, the outer layers, we have your capsule, not common in all, your, your middle layer, or possibly first layer, kung wala kang capsule, the cell wall, and after the cell wall would be your plasma membrane. Now, your plasma membrane class surrounds the cytoplasm. It is the site of energy synthesis. Now, whenever you hear the word energy synthesis involving cells, what type of energy is this? 
ATP. Okay, so, yung walang kamatayang ATP. So, it's adenosine triphosphate. Now, your plasma membrane will transport nutrients in and out of the cell. Then, your pili or your fibrae class. Now, your pili or fibrae is common among gram-negative bacteria. Mas common sila class sa gram-negative bacteria. An example of this would be your Escherichia coli and your Neisseria gonorrhea. Then, depending on the type of pili class, there are two types. Um, you have your sex pili and your common pili. Your sex pili will be responsible for the transfer of genetic material gene conjugation. Basically, this is responsible for your reproduction. Reproduction. Then another one would be your common pili. So it would be responsible for attachment to the host cell. So the sample class, um, a type of bacteria wanted, uh, wanted to infect the healthy cells. So what this bacteria will do, they will be surrounded by your pili. They would attach themselves to, let's say, a healthy cell. So a healthy cell. They would attach to the healthy cell using their common pili and slowly infect or kill or digest the healthy cell. Then we have your endospores. So your endospores class, this not all bacteria have this. These are resistant structures allowing your bacteria to survive in adverse conditions. Class, can you give you an organ that would have adverse conditions? Yung hindi pwedeng mabuhay, malabong mabuhay yung bacteria. Give me an organ. Wherein bacteria would have a hard time surviving. Uh, stomach, sir. Okay. Stomach acid. Uh, okay, because your stomach has what type of acid? I okay, so it, it has your hydrochloric acid. Now, um another give me another one. Yung typically talagang walang bacteria dapat. Malabong mabuhay. Liver, sir. No, no, not the liver. Well, it's not lang liver, but uh, possible magana ang bacteria doon, but another one. Kidney, sir? Mm, sterile din, but you can still get infected. Now, one of those, one of that would be your lungs. So, your lungs class, kaya nga sabi ko before, in a, in a few last meeting ata natin yun. Um, your MPD, mycobacterium tuberculosis, would live in the lungs. Now, um, MTB class are highly resistant. They have what you call spores. Now, these spores, specifically endospores class, would make them resistant, allowing the bacteria to survive in adverse conditions. Now, another one that can live in the lungs class would be your Clostridium right, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the stomach. Clostridium botulinum. Botulinum. Plus, have you heard of the word the sickness botulism? Nalinig niyo na yan. Do you have any idea what does botulism mean? Yes? So, when it comes to botulism class, this is a type of food poison. So, imagine yun na food poison kayo, your, your, um, your prestigium botulinum wasn't killed by the stomach acid. Now, how are endospores resistant? They are they contain what you call calcium dipicolinate or dipicolinic acid. Now, si calcium dipicolinate nyo class or dipicolinic acid is responsible for that resistance. So, other example would be your bacillus. So, this would be your anthrax, your bacillus anthracis, and your clostridium. So, an example of that would be your clostridium botulinum. Then another one would be your flagella class. Now, your flagella is responsible for the movement of your bacteria. So, kanina, di ba, we were talking about proof of life. How would you identify it as if the organism is viable? So, they would tend to move via the flagella. Now, your flagella class is common among bacilli and spirilla. Rare among oxi. So, again, common siya sa bacilli and your spirilla. Spirilla, your spirochetes. Rare among oxi. Now, an example of your motile bacteria would be your E. coli and your Salmonella typosa. While non motel are your Cleb Shella Nimonier and your Shigella Dysenterie. A motility class, if you want to view it on, an, 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 on a better uh, or a best, best um, situation, 
it is usually seen at 25 degrees centigrade or your room temperature. Now, depending on the bacteria class, if it's found among spirochetes, they would be called, your flagella would be called axial filaments or periplasmic flagella. Periplasmic flagella. Now, um, I discussed earlier that you could use the hanging trap motility to demonstrate motility. Uh, to demonstrate motility. Now, there are other methods class. Uh, one of those would be your use of semi-solid media. Now, your semi-solid media class involves three types of tests. Your SIM. You have your sulfur, your indole, and your motility. So, I won't discuss the first two because this is a part of a biochemical test for identifying enterics. So, when you say enterics class, these are bacteria involved sa digestive system. So let's just focus on your motility. So this is an example class of your sol semi-solid media. Your semi-solid media class would be gel-like. Gel-like sa class. Not, uh, not too soft, not too hard. Now what you do is that you're going to stab. You're going to stab the sample in a straight line onto the tube. Now you want to identify if the organism is motile. Now, what you're looking for would be what you call a sideway, sideway growth, pagilid. Now, if you notice, paganyan siya, oh. paganyan siya, sideways yung movement niya. Kasi hindi naman pwedeng pababa, uh, so most likely sideways siya class. To the point that the entire tube would, be, would change in color due to the movement or the motility of the organism. Any questions? Okay, then I don't know. Yes, Bob. What do you use to puncture, sir? Diba may mga tayong wire, uh, wire needle. So, diba may wire loop. So, we have your wire needle class. Um, you would dip that to the specimen. Tapos, stab mo na siya. Any more questions? Sir, ang negative, sir, hindi na ginag-spread ang... Hmm, Gan ganito lang siya. Uh, ito, ayan o, ganyan lang siya. Negative test. Okay, sir. Hindi siya kumalat okay. compared dito na nag-form talaga siya ng cloudness. Yes, Edward. So, da, kung magpara mga man, ang positive, so dapat ang bilog na test tube gidang ma-change color, hindi pwede ang sa ang patas sa yung, left side. Yung ganito, yung ganyan? Hindi, yung sa dalong, sa dalong, ang positive, so dapat bilog na test, test tube nag-change siya yung color. Ah, oh, kasi nag-change color yan depending sa uh, may indicator. Kasi yung SIM nyo class, your SIM has an indicator. So yung indicator class would uh, cause your bacteria to be colored. I forgot to mention the indicator. So your bacteria would tend to, to be red. Red lang ang color niya, Edward. Okay. And I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you. Okay. Mm, any more questions, class? Mas ma ano chocolate mas ma appreciate niyo to class pagdating natin ng biochemical test. Saya nga lang na kung face to face sana tayo mas may enjoy niyo to kasi kayo kayo mismo yung magtitimpla ng media. So wala um anyways, magagawa niyo rin yan in the future. Now another one to demonstrate your motility would be the use of your flagellar stain. So you have your Fisher and Gray and Lipson. Now for your flagellar stain class, you'd still use a biconcave slide. So depression same, lagay may sample, lagay may water. Then you have to put drops of the stain. Then you have to be fast in the situation kasi pwede mamatay yung bacteria. Magkaroon ka ng false non-motile organism. Then your hanging drop motility test, which I discussed earlier. Now, you could actually classify class your bacteria according to the number of their flagella. So the first one would be your monotricus. So from the word mono, meaning single. So your monotricus means single flagellum at one end. Amphitricus, meaning amphi, meaning both or, uh, or opposite ends. Amphitricus, single flagellum at each or both end. Now, another one will be your atricus, your A, meaning absence, absence or no flagella. Lopotricus, meaning a top of flagella at one or both ends. And peritricus, your bacteria being surrounded by flagella. So your peritricus class, this would be the most motile. So if your bacteria is peritricus, this would be the most motile. Sobrang para siyang kitikiti sa tubig class pag nakita niya yan sa microscope. 
Now, this is their appearance. So, we have your atricus, walang flagellum. Monotricus, a single flagellum. Amplitricus, single flagellum at both ends. Lofatricus, tough of uh, tough of flagella at one end. Peritricus, surrounding. Then, cephalotricus class, both ends with tough of flagella. Then, we have your metachromatic granules. So, class, remember kanina I discussed that certain organisms would have their endospores. Now, they would tend to thrive in adverse conditions. Now, remember, if they're living in adverse conditions, they do not have much food source. So certain bacteria would have metachromatic granules. These metachromatic granules would act as food reserves. Parang baon nila class, reserva for energy use. Now, depending on the type of bacteria, they, their metachromatic granules would change their name. So for mycobacterium tuberculosis, they are known as much, much granules. While for your corrine, Corrine bacterium, Corrine bacterium dipteriae, it is known as your Babes urns granules. Then another one would be your nucleoid. So, your class M, if you're going to compare this to a normal cell, this would be your nucleus. So, it's called a nucleoid sa bacteria. Your nucleoid would contain your DNA found in the center of the bacteria. Now, in the center of the bacteria class, this would be your uh, DNA content, diba? Do we you have your plasmid? Plus, your plasmid would carry the antibiotic resistant gene. So, let's say, class, this is your bacteria. Then, the patient will take in antibiotics. Now, ang reseta ng doctor is the patient has to take the antibiotic for seven days. Then, the patient suddenly decided, decided to stop at the fourth day kasi she's feeling well, she's feeling well, uh, she's feeling healthy. Now, due to that, um, 90, uh, let's say 70%, 70% of, uh, of the are, are, are dead and 30% of the bacteria are alive kasi hindi niya tinapos yung treatment na 7 days. Now, this 30% bacteria would now have a copy, a copy of the uh, antibiotic, antibiotic contents or antibiotic process nung Nung laman, nung laman ng antibiotic. Now, that, 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 uh, that, that would be copied by the plasmid and it would be transferred to future bacteria. So, magmultiply itong 30%. Then, the, the new ones, yung mga bagong bacteria, would now contain the contents of the antibiotic that was uh, unsuccessful in killing all of them, making them more drug-resistant. Ulitin ko, class, ha? Ang patient nyo, ang bawa ang patient nyo, masama pakiramdam. Nasitahan ng doktor ng gamot, i-take niya ng 7 days. Now, hindi niya tinapos. He did not finish the treatment. He ended it in 4 days. Since the patient did not finish it on the entire 7 days, not all of the bacteria were killed. The remaining surviving bacteria would then now have a copy of the antibiotic mechanism through the plasmid. Through the plasmid. Now, once they duplicate yung remaining na nabuhay, those alive bacteria, once they rep do, uh, replicate or uh, divide, they would now carry the antibiotic mechanism that was unsuccessful, producing a much more drug-resistant strain. So class, whenever a doctor tells you to finish, to take a certain antibiotic for a certain number of days, please try to finish that. Regardless if you feel healthy already, tapusin yun because that would cause a mutation of your bacteria leading to drug-resistant strains. Kaya nabubuo class yung mga MRSA. Yung MRSA nyo, then worse, nagkaroon na ng MRSA, and so on. Any questions? Yes? Uh, sir, Professor, if um, given um, antibiotic treatment, um, then, um, or it is recommended na um, exactly 24 hours um, um, interval from each na Mm. Yes, um, depending on the instructions, let's say um, if the doctor says um, two tablets, two tablets for seven days. So you have to make, you have to divide that into 12 hours. So the best option would be one in the morning and one in the evening. Then that's for a total of seven days. So 24 hours interval. But for every 24 hours, you have to take two tablets. Then you can divide in an equal number of hours. So, meron niyang, ano, meron niyang joke. 
there was a joke that uh, wag mo daw sundin, don't follow the the recommended uh, time, the recommended time of taking the antibiotic para daw ma-surprise yung bacteria. So, so that was a, that was a joke. <laughs> Ayan. Any more questions? Man? Okay. Uh, yes, uh, Anne. Sir, paano sa mga doctors mabalaan na like in seven days, mapatay na ang bacteria? Okay. What if the patient is severely infected mm -hmm. and in the seven days, there's still bacteria. So, after the seventh day, pwede pa ka-replicate ang bacteria and mag-develop sang resistance. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, that's actually a good question, uh, Ms. Anne. Actually, kaya yung tinatawag nila seven days. It's either, actually, it's either seven days or 14 days. Now, we have what you call pharmacology. Now, in pharmacology class, they would discuss um, how long yung effect ng isang, ng isang antibiotic would take effect to kill a certain, a certain type of bacteria. Now, usually, normally, depending on the type of possible bacteria, ang pinaka-minimum na nakita ko would be your 70s. Yan ang pinaka-shortest, one of the shortest um, number of days that you are to take the antibiotic. Now, may mga cases naman wherein the bacteria would be highly resistant or sobrang, sobrang hirap patayin. Sobrang hirap patayin. They would extend it up to 14 days. So I hope that answers your question, Ms. Anne. I, I don't really uh, know the exact uh, pharmacological ano, of, uh, of, of their basis. But uh, as I recall, when I, was, I asked, when I asked a doctor before, that's the reason na seven days ang usual interval to kill a type of bacteria. Then the longest one would be 14 days. But there are some um, bacteria class, MTB. I want to share to you. Your MTB class would take six months. Imagine nyo, six months kayong nagtitake ng four types of antibiotic. Those four types of antibiotic no, class are known as your sire. Streptomycin, isoniazid, rifampicin, etambutol. So, you're gonna take that for six months kasi nga sobrang, um, sobrang resistant nung, nung bacteria na yun. And that's for, for MTB found in the lungs. But if your MTB is found extrapulmonary, when you say extra, meaning outside, let's say you have a TB of the eye. My God, what naman? TB of the eye. Your treatment would last one year. So another factor to consider then sa tagal ng treatment would be the location of the infection. So if, if it's located in very, uh, very what they call this, very resistant areas, uh, the, the treatment would last longer then. And then just to share to your class, um, MDR, multiple drug resistant TB treatment would last one to two years. So, so if you know someone who has TB, kindly advise them to properly finish their treatments for their antibiotic intake. Okay. I hope that answers your question, Ms. Ann. Yes, sir. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any more question? Yes. Um, Miss Dalida? No, sir. But, uh, sir, for example, sir, now within four days, but, sir, nag-ayo na ang person, meaning, sir, sir na eliminate na ang bacteria or gamay na lang gid siya nabilin. That's why uh, na course ng antibiotic. Okay. Um, the reason why, bakit tayo kumagaling class in not exactly the seven days because, remember, the fewer the bacteria, the fewer the bacteria, the lesser the, the chance of your symptoms or the lesser the chance they could cause disease. So, if you're taking antibiotics, um, you're killing bacteria, most likely a good sign, a good prognosis is that you're, 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 you're going to feel well. But that does not technically mean that all of the bacteria are dead. So, you still have to finish the entire seven days as per recommended by the doctor. Uh, does that explain? I, I hope that answers your question, Ms. Delita. Another question, Pagid, sir. Kay, Sige lang. Ang ibang ba, sir, for example, ang amoxicillin, sir, gina-apply nila mm. directly sa samad. So, which is ang much <laughs> na effective, bala, sir, orally siya, or directly, gina-apply. Okay. So, whenever you're gonna take um, antibiotic class, you have to remember that the best, best, um, depending on the antibiotic, actually, but the best type of, uh, it's not mode of transmission, eh. The best way of uh, intake would still be oral. And that is also the safest. Kasi pag ginawa niyo yung, ano, yung ilalagay niyo yung amoxicillin, yung antibiotics sa wound, remember your skin has normal flora. 
So aside from from the pathogenic bacteria, you're also gonna kill your normal flora. So the best way of uh, intake would be still through your um, oral intake, through your digestive system. At least yun, um, equally, equally mag-spread yun sa body nyo. Instead of directly putting it sa wound, which not only affects the uh, normal flora of your skin, this can even cause uh, resistance. Eh. Pati yung ano, mag-cause pa yun ng drug resistance, maging resistant yung normal flora nyo dun sa antibiotic na yun. Kaya pag dumating yung time na your normal flora would become pathogenic, sila naman yung hindi tatabla ng, ng sakit. Kaya there are some cases class nga na kapag yung patient uh, may UTI, they would take a type of, uh, if I recall it was, sa palas po din ata, I forgot the exact antibiotic. Eh. Um, they would take it for five days. Then after a few days na naman, babalik na naman yung UTI nila. So, ayun. So, any more questions, Mr. Lida? I hope that explained it. Okay, na sir. Thank you. Okay. Any more questions? Okay. Turn on. Tanong lang kayo, class. Walang masama magtanong. Ha? I'll try to answer as much as possible. <laughs> okay. So, we have your ribosome. This is responsible for your protein synthesis. Now, your ribosome class would appear circular. Mga bilog-bilog yan. That's why, whenever you look at under the microscope, using an electron microscope, it would give a granular appearance to your bacteria. Then you have to take oh, note plus the main topic, which is your morphology of bacteria. Now, the largest bacterium known class is your Tio Margarita Namibiensis. Now, your Tio Margarita Namibiensis class is found in ocean sediments. And it's a general diameter of 0.1 to 0.3 millimeter. So remember, your most, most bacteria would range from 0.4 to 2 micrometers. But for your Tio Margarita Namibiensis, it would have a diameter of 0.1 to 0.3 millimeter. Normally, class, your bacteria would come in three basic shapes. And you have to consider what we call characteristic groupings. So let me explain that further. Now, here's a, here are the three most common shapes of your bacteria class. Your coccus, your bacillus, and your spiral. Now, your coccus or your cocci would appear as circular. Basically, they are spherical or ovoid. Now, a single cocci is known as a coccus. If they are um, two, they would be called diplococci. And if they are in a chain, they would be called chain of cocci. And a cluster of cocci. Now, let's test your knowledge if naalala niyo last meeting. What we call, what bacteria is gram-positive in grape-like clusters? What is the bacteria that is gram-positive? Yes. Staphylococci, sir. Staphylococci, what? That's the species. Arius. Okay, so it's your S. Arius. How about the gram positive cocci in chains? It's like No, that's your diplococci. Staphylococcus. Staphylococcus. Staphylococcus, what? What's the species? What's the species, class? Yung sa chain. Come on. Staphylococcus. Pyogenes. Okay, it's your pyogenes. Okay. Septococcus pyogenes. So, diplococci class would be your septococcus pneumonia, typically. Then we have also your bacillus or your bacilli. Now, they would come a single, single one, bacillus and a chain of bacilli. Now, your chain of bacilli would be known as your strepto, streptobacilli. Then, some bacteria class are pleomorphic. So, when you say pleomorphic, they could vary. Now, one known type of pleomorphic bacteria is your cocobacilli. So, your cocobacilli would be a mixture of your rod shape and your spherical shape. So, they would appear like an oblong. So, here's an example class. Your cocci would come in clusters. So, kumpul-kumpul sila, madami. Cocci would appear in chains, in pairs, in tetrads. Now, your so-called pleomorphic would be your cocobacilli. Then, they would come, they come in fusiform or palisading. So, your palisading would be um, arranged in an orderly manner. Then you also have your spirochetes. Now this is your what bacteria is this class? What's the gram? I know. Okay, so this, so this is your Staphylococcus or yours. They are, they appear as gram positive in grape-like clusters. So you can notice so para silang grapes na How about this one? So, 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 and this one would be your palisading class. So they're arranged. Para silang fence. 
So if you see niya mga bahay sa Amerika na may fence na ganyan. Then this would be your spider kids class. It's pretty bad. Now, um, you have to remember class that your bacteria have arrangements. So when I say arrangements and yung in chains and clusters. Now, by using these arrangements, you get to have a, a very brief idea on what they are called. So katulad niya sabi ko, your stop or use would appear in clusters. Your streptococcus pyogenes would appear in uh, chains. And your pneumonia would appear in pairs. So dun pa lang class, you would get to have an idea on, on their name. Now, your caucus arrangement are determined by their orientation and degree of attachment at the time of cell division. So what this means class is, diba, this is your caucus. They would divide. They would divide by a binary fission. So magahati sila. Then, depending on how they would divide at the time, they could form their arrangements. So pwede sila maging clusters. Pwede naman kapag nag-divide, ganyan sila. Pwede ganyan, pwede ganito, tapos nag-break off. They would produce your chains. Then, bacillus and spiral arrangements are less medically important. So, um, actually, class sa bacilli kasi, hindi ganun ka-importante yung arrangements nila. For your bacilli class, to further identify them, kasi madami sila, and marami ang physical appearance nila are almost the same, you have what you call your biochemical test. So your biochemical test would allow you to identify this bacillus, this bacilli. And as example of your biochemical test would be your sulfur and your indole. Plus, uh, hula na kayo. Uh, try nyo hulaan. What's the positive result for a sulfur? Sulfur test. Anong kulay? Red. Black. Red. Okay, so black. black. So it's black. <laughs> well, your indole would be red. So, yun yung reason kasi may indicator kasi yun. I'll, I'll be discussing that in the future. So, any questions for this? So, again, um, one one thing you need to remember class whenever you would uh, memorize a bacteria is their arrangement. So, that would help you to easily identify them. So, kapag gram-positive uh, in clusters, or use. Kapag in chains, um, pyogenes. Kapag in pairs, it's your step ng focus ng mundi. So there's a further, ano. Now, I want you to take note of this class. Your Vibrio. Now, we have what you call um, Vibrio cholerae. Or cholera. Now, this is known to cause your cholera. Now, your cholera class would be characterized by profuse. Profuse, watery, diarrhea. Now, who can tell me the meaning of the word profuse? What's the meaning of the word profuse class? Any ideas? Abundant, sir. Abundant. So, continuous, plenty, quarterly diarrhea. Now, if you recall a few years ago, uh, I think it was a decade na, uh, a certain area would have a outbreak of cholera. We're into the point that all the the ones infected with cholera would become dehydrated. So, sobrang dehydrated nila class. They would become weakened and they would die. So, ganun kalala yung Vibrio nyo. Now, your Vibrio cholerae class, if I recall, can also be found in the sea. But then again, hindi naman siya yung typical na ano talaga, na makaka-infect makaka sa'yo if it's in the sea. The, the only possible reason class your Vibrio could infect you if, you if there is fecal content in the water there you are drinking. So, if the fecal content has positive for, for Vibrio, yan, um, through the oral fecal route, oral fecal route, you could get your cholera. Any questions? So aside from that, you have cocci, diplococci, streptococcus, sarsenae, staph, bacilli, streptobacilli, spirochids, vibrio, and coco bacilli. So that ends our module two. Are there any questions?